Welcome everyone to our webinar on education and advocacy for environmental justice. I'm Stefania Ekonomou, a political scientist working at Web2Learn, and together with Katerina Zuru, the head of Web2Learn, we're extremely glad to welcome you all in this Erasmus Plus funded uh, webinar uh, from the Green Vetters project. Today with us, we have four amazing speakers who will share with us their great experiences on the field with communities. A few words about the project. So Green Vetter focuses on the vocational education and training sector and aims to integrate citizen deliberation and deliberative democracy into curricula of vet schools. Until now, the project has produced a handbook on the Green Deal and citizen deliberation. We have also produced a pedagogical guide on citizen engagement and deliberative democracy for climate action in vet schools. And currently we are working on the production of the online training courses for vet educators in agriculture and engineering, while by the end of the project we'll release a report uh, that will summarize a collection of good practices. Uh, you can check and uh, access our resources on the project's website and follow us on our Instagram and Facebook accounts to be updated about our upcoming events. Now, uh, in this short presentation, you have heard many times the word citizen deliberation. Let's find out together what it really means. So in a citizen deliberation process, citizens are called to deliberate on a matter of social interest in a, with the aim to achieve a common ground. Some most known forms of citizen deliberation are citizen assemblies and citizen juries. However, in a citizen deliberation process, people are not just called to express their views on a social matter. What distinguishes uh, citizen deliberation processes from formal discussions, formal public discussions, is that citizens become fully aware of the issue they talk about. They know the facts and they have access to data and evidence provided to them by the organizers. So theoretically, let's assume that we participate in a deliberation process in which we discuss about air quality in our city. Before we start exchanging our opinions on the issue, we need to be aware, we need to get access to the necessary information in order to form our position. And this information will come uh, uh, from data provided by official air monitoring sensors or also by data provided by citizens who participate in scientific research. Now you may have heard of people who are nature enthusiasts or people who are motivated by an environmental problem in their area and that made them join a scientific project in order to understand the issue and provide solutions. So this kind of citizens participation in science is another way people can engage in a processes that actively shape the well-being of their communities. So until now, we have talked about two different forms of citizen engagement. The one refers to engagement in public deliberation processes, and the other one is about participation in science and scientific research. But do they both share any connections are, or are they in totally different fields of practice? From our exploration of citizen engagement in science and deliberation, we have observed a common pathway uh, that connects these two seemingly uh, diverse fields. Sorry, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So I'll restart with the slides. I think you lost me. Okay. So I was saying that from our exploration uh, in citizen engagement in science and deliberation, uh, we have observed that there is a common pathway that connects these two seemingly uh, diverse fields. First of all, uh, we have observed that in both types uh, of engagement, people become fully aware or aware of this issue at stake. 
and they develop scientific literacy thanks to the relationship they forge with data and with scientific methodologies. In the same token, we see that both types of engagement can lead to the generation of active citizenship identities, while both can result in action taken by people involved in these practices. Now, in the framework of the Green Vetters project with Katerina Zuru, we have released a pedagogical guide on citizen engagement uh, for climate action in the vet sector, in which we outline barriers, but also opportunities for the integration of citizen deliberation in vet schools. Moreover, we have also produced a paper on deliberation and environmental sustainability competencies uh, in which we see citizen science as a bridge to their integration in vet schools. Here is an indicative uh, set of actions and policies that show, that manifest the interest on the topic by European Union institutions. Now, talking about how citizens can be engaged in shaping the well being of their communities, we host today a webinar on environmental justice with a special focus on education and advocacy. We will talk about uh, community engagement through citizen science in situations of social environmental degradation. We would also like to share with you that this webinar is a follow up to another webinar we hosted on December on environmental citizen sensing, again in the context of the Green Veterans Project. Now we're extremely glad to share with you uh, this amazing uh, panel of speakers. We have together with us Lucy Grail, project officer at the NGO A Should, Daniele Tubino, a postdoc researcher from the Wageningen University, Anna Berti Suman, Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellow uh, at the European Commission Joint Research Center and the Sensus Initiator, and Flaviano Bianchini, founder and director of the NGO Source International. A few words about the overall plan of the webinar. We'll start with short one minute uh, statements by each speaker, and then we'll uh, switch to the eight minute presentations by each uh, speaker. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll leave some time for questions, a QA discussion and conclusions. Now with no further ado, I will stop screen sharing and I will call on uh, Lucy for her one minute statement. Lucy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefania. Um, I would say that um, citizen science applied to environmental monitoring is an incredible tool to support uh, grassroots in the struggle for environmental justice. So the application we have of this kind of practice for us is a way uh, to engage and support and reinforce environmental justice by doing a citizen science which is developed by citizens and for citizens. Thank you, Lucy. Great statement. Daniele, over to you. Thank you, Stefania. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Katarina and Stefania, for this nice invitation and to share this space uh, and ideas here in the webinar. Uh, today I will talk about my experience and my understanding of action research and, and how I approach it as a um, transformative learning process. It will be um, a little bit conceptual, I will bring some concepts and then in the end I would like to, to also link it with some experiences and concrete uh, yeah, examples uh, that I'm working with. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. Anna? Yes, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I let's say I would be contributing from my perspective of an environmental lawyer and a researcher on civic monitoring when this practice actually interfaced the judiciary, so courts, but also alternative dispute resolution, because I believe citizen science is never the end, but rather the start of a process. And so, so for bringing data somewhere, we also need a bit of the uh, legal understanding of what this data can actually do. 
Diana, Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I think I am the only scientist here talking about citizen science uh, because I am a scientist and I will speak today about the fact that we as a scientist, that for me, the importance of citizen science is that we as a scientist, we cannot be everywhere at the same moment. So we do need to rely on citizen to proper monitoring uh, the entire world. I mean, which is obviously uh, not feasible, but like a, 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 a huge part of it, at least. Uh, so today I will tell you one story of one of our cases in where common citizen were able to do to become a scientist and obtain results and remedies for environmental degradation. And that's it. Thank you, Piano. Looking forward to your presentation as well. So time for speakers' whole presentations. First speaker is Lucy Gray. I will start by introducing Lucy and then I will give her the floor. So Lucy is an anthropologist by training. Lucy is a member of the Italian environmental organization ASUD since 2008, where she works as a project officer, manager, researcher, and trainer. Lucy is also president of the CDCA, the Documentation Center on Environmental Conflicts. She is also an environmental and climate activist. Lucy coordinates and participates in different citizen science projects for participative environmental monitoring in the Rome, in the area of Rome. Lucy, thank you very much for being here with us. The floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you, Stefania. And again, thank you for inviting us to this, uh, to this great webinar. I'm very happy to share uh, some of our experience. Um, we have been working in citizen science uh, we started with Source, so it's very nice to be with Flaviano here today. Uh, they have been helping us in our first attempt. Uh, in the last uh, three years, we have been developing different projects uh, in Rome. Uh, today, I would like to present you this uh, project called Roma Up. Uh, it's a participatory environmental monitoring in Rome that we have been developing in particular on the two main rivers of the city. And I will tell you a bit more about it, but we also have studied uh, various kind of uh, experimentation, uh, including with schools uh, and with various grassroots. So I was, as I was saying in the beginning in our statement, um, being ourselves an, uh, an organization working in the field of environment and climate justice, um, we saw in citizen science and environmental participatory environmental uh, monitoring a way for us to reinforce a current struggle for the defense of given uh, natural spaces or natural resources in the city and around the city. So this is a bit our approach. Um, what we, um, why we use participative environmental monitoring. So what also brought us uh, to that kind of, uh, of activities. Uh, for us, it was important at some point to acquire more environmental data. So to produce ourselves and through the engagement of citizen environmental data that were lacking or that were uh, not uh, enough available. Um, it's also a way to strengthen a sense of community uh, and belonging of citizens, citizens that become sentinels of their uh, own environment or the environment around them. And it's uh, very interesting in particular when looking at working on uh, fresh water on the rivers in a big city like Rome where people uh, do not really have a relation with the river. So that also helped to build a connection with the natural space in our city. And it's a fundamental path, those of producing uh, environmental data and analyzing environmental data for the dialogue between the decision maker, the environmental controllers and scientists and also concerned citizens, in particular grassroots that are already active in, the, in a given territory. With the Roma Up project, uh, our objective was to increase the knowledge of the Rome citizens on the health status uh, on various environmental matrices, in particular on water, but also on air and soil. So we have been developing a kind of a program more than a, than a project that have seen various kinds of uh, activities. The core activities that we have been implementing in the last two year and a half now has been the one of um, monitoring uh, the health of the Tiber and the Aniene rivers in Rome uh, through starting with a co-design approach on the research action. 
So we are not uh, a research entity, we're not a university, we are not uh, a research center, but we started with grassroots analyzing the issues they were looking at and where there could be space for data gathering that could be useful to support their claims or their struggle for the defense of a given environmental issue. And we engage scientists to drive to help us, guide us through this uh, co-design research action, and then uh, get with us through the whole process of data gathering and analysis. On the river, that, uh, that's what brought us to get many sample collection uh, on 12 areas around the two rivers to got to analyze it. So we basically go there once a month on the two rivers on those 12 points to gather water with citizens and make analysis on uh, about nine chemical and physical parameters uh, that could uh, help us to better understand what are the issue of the river. And this way we engage over hundred citizens in this data gathering and we are looking at uh, pH, a temperature, a conductivity, uh, some dissolved solid turbidity, phosphate, nitrates, ammonium, and also, and most importantly, when we see at the issue we have in Rome, uh, Escheria coli. Um, some activities that I will give you some insight of the type of activities that we have been developing because working on the rivers has been the main activity that took most of our time, but we also uh, had activities to train grassroots. So we had organized in two and a half ten training on participatory monitoring of hair, soil, and water, uh, but also on fundraising and advocacy strategies, so kind of a complete set of training for grassroots, and that led to engage about 24 committees and more than 80 activists from the area of Rome to be trained on citizen science for them to better understand how they can use this kind of approach and tools to support their struggle. Uh, we have been working because as an organization, we work a lot with schools and within schools. So we also apply this kind of activity to schools, uh, starting with training teachers. So we have been organizing two training courses on citizen science applied to environmental education. And we uh, train like this more than 100 teachers throughout the country in Italy. Uh, we have been engaging the kids also in some sampling. And we had recently uh, also action regarding hair monitoring. So we have been engaging uh, 125 kids from elementary school uh, in STEAM activity for data collection. So building a hair quality sensor and monitoring the, the hair quality around their schools. And we have been doing also uh, other collaboration on hair monitoring with uh, the University Sapienza and with various grassroots in three different neighborhoods using different tools from deposimeters, but also uh, dust samplers and uh, other and vegetation analysis, analysis, engaging here about 35 uh, activists. And this is uh, something we are uh, into process to help them better understand issues related to air quality as well. Um, we have just released uh, our report after two years of, of study on the rivers. Um, and I would like to share some of the, and I will finish here, uh, some of the outcome of this research. So we spend all this time and we engage all these people to gather water samples and analyzes, uh, analyzing them. Of course, not just because we love the river, but to better understand the issue. And we had a huge, we discovered uh, that we have big problem with the water uh, quality of our river regarding Escheria coli. They are very highly concentrated in particular in various uh, spots of the river and we identify like this specific area where we are asking now the local authorities and uh, the environmental controllers to check uh, eventual abusive sewage spills uh, as well as a potential failure of purific purification plan plant. This is an example of how we can reinforce the work that environmental controllers at institutional level already do because so often they lay time, they lay money to do that. And we can then accelerate the process, identifying issues and identifying way, of course, to double check and to solve the problem. So that's an example we have with Escheria coli. Uh, another field of uh, criticalities that emerge from this water analysis is that there are very high values of nitrates and phosphates um, those uh, elements might be uh, related, for example, to fertilizer rather than uh, other spills related to industry or, or urban activities that need to be 
further explored and let's say that uh, classical institutional monitoring have not uh, allowed to identify it as, as specifically as we did. So here too, it's a second field of research that will arise from these two year experiments that we had. Um, for us in general, doing this kind of research is a way to get a more comprehensive and continuous and uh, more complete data gathering than uh, in our case, the, the institution managed to do. And we are trying also to do advocacy work with them, not only for them to retake uh, and reuse the data that we produce, but also try to bring them to produce more interoperable data. So to be able to have institutional data that can dialogue with citizen science data in order to get uh, a, a more proficuous collaboration and try to solve together the environmental issues that our city is facing. Um, that's my, my contact for, for any, any question or if you're interested in getting in touch with us. And we are doing many more projects uh, around the city on other, on other topics. So I would be eventually happy to discuss that with the participants if they are interested in the topic. I thank you again and I will, and I will stop there for the moment. Thank you very much, Lucy. It's a very interesting and insightful overview of your work in the area of Rome. Very rich. Thank you, Lucy. Over now to our second speaker, uh, Daniele. Daniele Tubino, who is a postdoc researcher at the Water Resources Management Group at Wageningen University. Uh, Daniele's research articulates in the fields of environmental and social sciences with a focus on action-oriented research methods. Danielle is particularly interested, uh, interested in social, transformative, and transgressive learning processes enacted by grassroots initiatives. She is currently part of the coordination team of the Wageningen-based projects Riverhood and River Commons, and was the content coordinator of the Wageningen MOOC on Transformative Citizen Science for Sustainability. Thank you, Danielle, for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stefania. Um... I will share then my screen. Um, can you see it? Yes, just yeah. make it okay. great. Well, um, so I'd like to, to start my presentation by asking uh, two questions to help me uh, make my point around the importance I see in action research to tackle our current problems. So first of all, why action research? Or why am I interested in, in action research and why I think it is, uh, this is something so important? So when I think about the production of knowledge and how we produce knowledge, how we produce narratives about reality, actually, I understand that we are producing the reality itself. So we cannot separate that. But then I, I, I ask myself, what kind of reality, what kind of society are we creating and are we supporting? Uh, is it an inclusive society, uh, a just society? Is it a reality where nature is not seen as a resource to be exploited, where we really create conditions for life uh, to thrive and where we understand ourselves within this web of interdependence uh, and in most cases, what I see is that the answer is no. And then I ask myself uh, how to produce then critical knowledge that can change society in a way that is life supporting, that is just. But then the other question is uh, how, how, uh, what does it imply actually? How to do action research? What does it imply doing action research? Uh, doing citizen science from that perspective, I would say as well. Uh, for me, it really implies supporting grassroots local movements which struggle for participation, for justice, for equity, for regeneration of nature. And it implies, therefore, a, a political co commitment, I would say, from the researcher with those groups, uh, with the struggles we are supporting. And it implies acting uh, with empathy uh, acting with solidarity, uh, doing research together uh, to indeed transform a local struggle and also to transform everyone involved. Um, including the researcher, I would say the researcher uh, slash activist. And uh, so it's, it's not about researching objects, it's not about researching subjects, but it's about doing research together in a collaborative way 
uh, and going through a transformative learning process uh, through that. Uh, here I bring the, the image of Faust Borda. Faust Borda was a Colombian uh, social scientist who put forward this idea of participatory action research and who advocated for this uh, idea that I'm uh, now talking about. Um, and by saying that, I would like to, to add here the perspective of critical pedagogy, which for me is crucial and which are actually the lenses I use to do uh, to approach participatory action research or action research. So a critical pedagogy is an educational approach with a long tradition in Latin America that strives for the emancipation and for the collective empowerment of uh, grassroots groups that are looking for environmental justice um, and for more sustainable ways of living. Um, and by bringing uh, critical pedagogy to the scene here, to, uh, to the discussion, I would like to detail uh, a few concepts that I think are really important to understand when we think about uh, critical pedagogy as a, a way to see uh, action research. And I think they are really important to be acknowledged uh, while doing action research. So I, I see uh, three main pillars in critical pedagogy. Uh, first of all, this inseparable relationship between knowledge and power. The second one would be this idea of uh, relational ontologies or uh, uh, learning as a relational process. Uh, this, and the third pillar is about uh, recogni recognizing the plurality of views with which we are dealing with. So the power knowledge binary or uh, relationship has to do with, uh, I think, asking ourselves some important questions. For instance, what is considered valid and non-valid knowledge? Which practices and which discourses are accepted and which are not? And the most important question, I think, behind it, uh, what's the dominant narrative actually uh, defining the answers to those questions? And for instance, I would say that one still dominant narrative that we have nowadays is that of separation, that narrative of nature as a resource to be exploited, for instance. So the idea here is that it's, it's really important to unravel those narratives and understand them uh, and answer those questions to be able to transform reality and to create new uh, narratives, more positive ones. The other pillar, which is about learning as a relational process or relational ontologies, I, I can also call it that, it means that um, we don't do this transformation alone. Uh, it's about really recognizing the potential uh, to promote transformation through col collaborative and co-creative processes. So uh, it has to do also with moving beyond this, this dualistic view uh, either focused on the object and the subject as separate, uh, separable entities, but it's about recognizing that we are shaping reality together and the reality is shaping us back. So it's a relational process, a co-creative process. And the third pillar that I would like to, to emphasize here is about uh, the plural views, recognizing that while doing research. So, the idea here is that there are many different ways of, of uh, uh, explaining reality. And, and there is no truth, actually. There is no truth out there to be captured uh, uh, that can be explained by those who have the right tools to do so. So it really, this, this idea really invites us to, to cultivate curiosity by the other and not exclusion. And, and from that perspective, actually, uh, we don't approach problems uh, based on a very rigid pre-assumptions uh, that uh, something is right or something is wrong, but we are open to explore together and to co-create. Of course, uh, I have to emphasize that it doesn't mean that I will support all types of narratives. Of, of course, if I see that that's a narrative is not supporting life, I will have to take a stance and to position myself towards that. But it's really about recognizing that and be open to conversation and to build something together. 
And then finally, uh, just to link those ideas with some work in practice and what, with what I've been doing uh, in the field of action research and citizen science, I'd like just to bring um, a long field experience I had in Brazil. So it's about the regeneration of the social ecological quality of a local stream uh, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Uh, I'm from Brazil, by the way. Uh, so I've been doing research, action research with this community for almost two years. Um, and there is a local grassroots movement to recover this area, uh, both socially and, and uh, ecologically. And we did uh, a lot of uh, activities. Uh, we applied a lot of methods, uh, action research methods to, to uh, create and to support this movement. So, for instance, uh, counter mapping activities, theater, dialogue with the community, uh, protests, uh, river walks, um, also citizen science and, and, and the monitoring uh, of the water quality, some very hands on uh, cleanup activities, uh, dialogue, a lot of dialogue, uh, world cafes, and, and here it's myself. Uh, talking about research ideas with the local community to get inputs and to exchange uh, knowledge uh, and get feedback. Uh, and today um, I'm involved as a postdoc researcher uh, in two large projects around uh, rivers. Uh, they are called Riverhood and River Commons. It's about doing action research. Uh, supporting grassroots initiatives in, in diverse countries uh, around the world. So these communities, uh, uh, riverine communities, they are fighting for environmental justice and, and for sustainability. And we are engaged with uh, many initiatives there in, in these countries. Um, and also, finally, this idea of um, transformative citizen science for sustainability which we are um, advocating in this uh, VUR MOOC. So it's about uh, uh, citizen science that is more engaged, that is really from the bottom up, uh, grassroots. Uh, so these are some uh, ways of uh, enacting those ideas I've been talking in the beginning uh, from the perspective uh, of action research. So thank you very much. If you have uh, any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And uh, I leave it from here yeah thank you thank you daniele a very interesting overview of your work with communities on the ground our next speaker now is anna anna berti suman anna is a researcher at the european commission joint research center in italy where she enthusiastically leads the sensing for justice project on the potential of civic environmental monitoring as a source of evidence in court. She got her PhD from the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society, and she is also a lawyer with work experience on environmental and climate cases located from South America to Northern Europe. Anna is also passionate about science management and engagement, art-based methods of research and slow ethnography. Anna, thank you very much, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks, thanks Stefania for, for this great introduction and, and of course uh, web to learn for hosting this great um, uh, workshop. I mean, I think something really cool of um, what just uh, shared by Daniel is also this idea of using theater, walks, uh, and I think some of um, the experience that I'll share from my project side can resonate with it. And of course, uh, with Flaviano and Lucy, there's also great connection. So I think um, it's really nice to be in this space together. Um, I'll share a few very visual slides. Um, and I think very soon you will be able Okay, not to see the meeting control. Is it okay? Let me see, maybe it reappear. Okay, yes. Okay, so you can see it well. Yes, 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 Anna. Okay. 
Great, great. So the project I'm um, leading at the JRC, so the European Commission Science Hub, which is basically the scientific advice for uh, EU policymakers, which also comes with great responsibility, but also great opportunities, is called Sensing for Justice. And this idea is that basically people sense for claiming something and this something I'm interested in is really when people sense for demanding environmental, social, climate justice. So the Sensing for Justice project um, has the objective to, let's say, reconnect an experience that comes from far and then comes from close. So in a way, I enjoyed hearing uh, false border mentioned because I think in our, let's say, um, Western research projects, we rarely build on um, epistemologies from the South. And I had the great opportunity when I was uh, younger to work um, on the Chevron Pepsaco case of oil pollution in the rainforest. And what was very visible there is that people exposed to environmental stressors were gathering evidence that were in a way meaningful for demonstrating an oil induced harm that was ongoing for decades. And so the interest brought me closer to research how people in different places of the world, in the north, in the relative south of the north, for example, the south of Italy, Basilicata, but also in the global south, gather evidence as a form of resistance, of reaction to environmental stressors that they experience. So in this picture, I'm situated close to a water stream and I'm, let's say, gathering a small um, water, water sample to understand whether there is any form of contamination in water. But when you do that, you never do it just for yourself. So a red line that kind of followed my life uh, from being a lawyer to a uh, present day that I consider myself more of a researcher, maybe not a scientist, but definitely a researcher, um, is the passion towards this that I call the civic sentinels. And I intentionally don't use the word citizen, but rather civic, because um, every person really also people that are in motion that do not connect to a citizenship that do not recognize their states for example indigenous uh, nationalities can sense the environment and thus become sentinels how do people record their environmental uh, conditions in multiple ways so they may rely on some uh, technological device, uh, which uh, could be called sensors, but they often use whatever they have, for example, just a notebook or um, indeed um, a, sending letters, re remembering memories. But many times, especially people that are displaced for environmental reasons, they just have their memories. And this is where the role of the researchers is key, but also of lawyers that would interfere face this client, it's very important to understand how we can leverage this information for something. In this picture, you see a person just gathering a small uh, water sample. And there are a number of elements that for those in the room, which may not be aware on what really citizen sensing entails, I would like to just uh, disentangle. So first of all, what is the objective? Indeed, environmental justice. And I'll bring a great case from Texas. This was really the, the triggering case that brought us to, to start the Sensing for Justice project, because we uh, witnessed a groundbreaking case where Diane Wilson and her fellow fisherwomen and fishermen collected plastic sample to demonstrate violation of the Clean Water Act the US Clean Water Act based almost exclusively on evidence gathered by ordinary people. And these people brought the company to court for a millionary damage, um, 
ruling. And now uh, Diane, she won this year the Goldman Prize for Environmental Protection. I think this is a great recognition of the Sentinels all over the world. But how people reach that stage? So first of all, there is no geographical boundaries. They can be far away or closer. Often they use sensors, but they may even just use their senses. In particular, the people, the fisher women in um, uh, Texas just used uh, simple plastic bags where they put all the plastic uh, particles, plastic nurdles in, so they didn't need any sophisticated tool. Then they, there is a risk, so people feel exposed to something that they want to address in a way. And then often these people want to disseminate and so use map, visualization, databases to really spread the news among fellow citizen people. And they often show distrust towards the institutional actor that are in charge of managing the problem. And so with all these elements coming closer again, what this census project does is really to perform research on the action of the civic sentinels, but really based on needs. So really we get contacted by actors performing activities that are similar to the one that we are already following, because these people are interested on how they can bring this evidence to courts or for being used in alternative dispute resolution. And how we try to translate our case study material and learning to broader publics, we really experiment. So from being in traditional advocacy forum, like the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, but also in more, let's say, out of the box spaces like parks, festivals, schools, with media that are, of course, lighter, more accessible. And of course, this engagement strategy is paying uh, off because basically we realize that people that generally weren't so uh, into these, like for example, youngsters, uh, activists, but also for example, uh, migrant communities are starting getting closer and understanding that basically it's not like you need to subscribe to a project, but each of us can be a sentinel. And especially if they're exposed to an environmental stressor, they would get to us in order to find advice to then channel this information in the right fora. So I would like to conclude saying that basically this is a still very much a dynamic arena. The project is ending this summer, which is quite unfortunate, but there is a lot of energy which we would like to uh, bring forward. So if you have cases where you think communities are gathering evidence potentially relevant for demonstrating environmental harm, in particular in judicial settings, do reach us. We would be super happy to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. We're looking forward to the continuation of your work after Sense 2 also. And now to our last but not least speaker, Flaviano Bianchini. Flaviano is an environmentalist and a naturalist. For several years, he has been dealing with violations of human rights and health damage related to the extractive industries with a special focus in Latin America. In 2009, he founded Source International that hosts a group of scientists and lawyers who work with communities to provide evidence of pollution and human rights abuses. Flaviano, thank you for being with us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I just realized that I, I don't know why I sent you a presentation that says in 2009, but actually Source International was founded in 2012. And at the end of 2012, so we are celebrating our 10 years. And it's an organization that actually works by providing scientific evidences and assistance to communities uh, affected by extractive industries. But as soon as we found an organization, actually even before that, we realized what I said before, that we as a scientist, we cannot be everywhere. And therefore, we need to rely on local people or people who live in those communities and who are always there and can assess the pollution by themselves. Uh, over those 10 years, we have been working pretty much all over the world. Uh, we started mostly in South America and with mining activities, but we have developed projects all over the world in several different uh, type of pollution and, 
and other type of human rights violation caused through the environmental degradation. Today, I will speak to you about one of our cases because we have only oh, over 40 cases. So I will just speak about one, which is in Peru and it's the city, the mining city of Cerro de Pasco, which is up in the Andes at 4,400 meters on the sea level. And it, it has this huge mine in the middle of the city, which is 200 kilometers long, 1.8 kilometers wide and 900 meters deep. So it's basically a huge mountain upside down and where the mining waste has been put it all over the city up to surround the hospital. What you can see here is the public hospital of Cerro de Pasco surrounded by mining waste. Uh, and also this is the lake of Culacocha, which has been filled with mining waste until he became uh, as acid as the acid of the batteries. It was one of the most polluted lakes on earth, despite the fact that Lake Culacocha in Quechua means the lake of seagulls used to be a lake where the Andean seagull used to reproduce. Nowadays, obviously, every bird that touched the water died. And the only mitigation strategy that's been applied is that you, just to put a fence on it, saying that if you go close to the water, then you might die. So better you not go. Uh, and then obviously, there is a huge health affectation of people. Our last report, our last study demonstrated that there is uh, a lot of brain development impediment up to the fact that the average IQ of children in Sarah de Pasco is 12 points lower than the national average, which is basically the difference for a children to become an engineer at the university or struggling to finish secondary school. So basically we are denying the future to the entire community and entire children. And obviously this has rose also a lot of conflicts in town and outside the town. So up to us, this is Cerro de Pasco, and this is, for example, the, the pipe of wastewater from the mining facilities that is just thrown into the environment. And this is called Rio Ragra, it's a river that basically uh, the spring is just a few meters up, upstream, and then it just received this huge amount of polluted water. And obviously, I mean, the first time we arrived there, we did our analysis and we discovered how polluted is this area but then we wanted to keep monitoring. And the only way to do it was through citizen science. So educate people, teach to local communities how to perform their own monitoring in order to be able to monitor this pollution like over and over, like day by day, basically. Uh, so for example, in a lake, Ulacocha, with you know, some specific equipment, we can measure the pH. And as I mentioned, it's more acid than the acid of the batteries and some heavy metals and other pollutant. And these are graphs that has been produced by local communities with local communities analysis. So for example, we can see here the concentration of aluminum in the Rio San Juan, which is a and, and lead, which is uh, the main river where the Rio Ragra is tributary. So we have clean water upstream, then receive the Rio Ragra and the concentration of lead, for example, is 400 times over the limit. And this is like 20 kilometers downward, and this is 50 kilometers downward. So basically, local communities were able to assess how on an important river like the Rio San Juan, which is a big river, uh, the effect of the discharge of the Rio Ragra, it, it impacts and it affects heavily the pollution of the river up to 50 kilometers downstream, where it ended up in a lake, which is actually even a national park. Uh, similar with other metals, so we have seen copper, iron, manganese, all of this had been possible through uh, is the average measures or month of, of, of measurements. So it has been possible only by the presence of local communities that can measure basically every two weeks the pollutant in the river. Uh, another problem uh, is the dust that is generated by those stockpiles. So the stockpiles are these huge mountains of mining waste that are pretty much everywhere inside of the Pasco. So here you can see the two communities where we work the most that are basically squeezed between the open pit and two different stockpiles. And so you can see here, like literally communities surrounded by these huge stockpiles. And, and this is a prospection of the dust deposition that we have made uh, according to a model of winds and, and dust uh, reclamation. But the community were able to use these instruments 
And obviously, as always happened in citizen science with a bit of uh, um, creativity, uh, because as I mentioned, Sara de Pasco is 4,400 meters on the sea level, and the maximum temperature ever recorded in Sara de Pasco is 14 degrees. And very often at night, it goes below zero, and those instruments do not work below zero. And actually, they don't work properly even below 10 degrees. So we have to create this sort of box, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a normal box. And this is one of those electric warmer that normally you use before going to bed, if you have stomach ache or something like that. And with Alpaca wool to maintain the temperature, we were able to basically construct uh, a machine that is able to connect it to electricity, obviously, is able to collect dust deposition, PM2.5 PM and PM10, and, and also dust, breathable dust uh, inhalation uh, data. And those, these machines record 24 hours. So you have to go and download the data every day, basically, or every two days is a max, and you have to change the filters every 24 hours. So either us move to Cerro de Pasco or Season Science is the only way. Uh, same here by collecting uh, soil analysis, uh, soil data. The seasons are very different. So there's a dry season and wet season. And this changes a lot in the composition of pollutant. Uh, just try imagine the amount of water, how much can dilute the pollutant and the amount of dry season, how much dust can deposit on, on soil and therefore uh, create a different type. And the, the only good monitoring is if it lasts long. Uh, uh, again, so weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, but it must go ahead for a long time. We are now doing this since 10 years in the past, so we have 10 years of monitoring. And then the, the key aspect of scientific evidences and, 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 and data, which is make a difference between us and scientific science and citizen science to like just proper normal investigation that goes nowhere is a dissemination of the data. So obviously there is a huge part that is collecting the data, but then there is another huge part, which is share this data with the community, share this data with the media, make it possible to everyone to, to know the, the, the situation and doing advocacy and lobby activities in order to obtain something. Uh, so basically our strategy is that once we have all the data, we, we start doing a series of advocacy activities and dissemination, try to obtain some results. And last year, we obtained the uh, the, the Congress of Peru uh, declared Cerro de Pasco like something of national interest. They create a special commission. And early this year, I, I actually went to Peru and present the data of our last study and the citizen science data to the Congress. And the Congress adopted a measure for in this was in May this year, the, the Congress adopted a measure to uh, environmental uh, cleaning, a cleaning plan basically of the Rio Ragra, which is the most affected, the one where the pipe uh, of wastewater of the mine goes. Um, so through citizen science, we were able to basically obtain uh, a law change actually. Thank you.